in a historic market town is a family-run treasure trove. You ready? Drum. Drum roll. Packed with fascinating military antiques. Expect the unexpected. Anyone could walk in with anything. You don't come across something like this every day of the week. From pieces that tell the stories of our past. This is priceless. To unique personal collections. You've got his entire can, story. Really, this is all music to my ears. Yeah. All in demand across the globe. It's sold. Get the label on and then let's get them away. Dave Newer makes the deals. Is there any yeah. discount on this? You've had a very big discount while son Steve uncovers the hidden secrets behind their finds. I've never read anything like this. It's nerve shredding, it's, you know, it's spine tingling. For collectors looking to buy a piece of history. Yeah, it's always better in the flesh, isn't it? Thank you very much, boys. The beers are on me. Done. Today, the team uncover a hero's helmet that survived the Blitz. This was there. The fires were raging yeah. all around it. Yeah. The person was underneath trying to do everything they could. A treasured memento from World War I's Western Front. Your father brought these back from the song. Yeah. yeah. I like them and I'd like to buy them. And a rare Victorian pistol belonging to a mysterious gentleman. This is the, the stuff of dreams. You don't want to put it down, do you? You don't want to let it go. It's so beautiful. Dave Newer and son Steve live and breathe military history and have a keen eye for the exceptional and the highly collectible. We look for diversity. We like the unusual, the rare, the special. Something with an individual story. You're looking for something with a bit of magic in there. This Runderbus is a quality museum piece. It's a piece of history. It's one of the best things I've ever bought it's something like a cross between a rifle and a cannon. Yeah, yeah it, it, it has elegance but lacks subtlety. You always want to buy something because you like it, because you love it, because you want to own it. And invariably, if you feel like that about something, somebody else will as well. We wanted to own that. We had to own that. It's, it's cracking. And if we make money at the end of the day when we sell it, fine. It's a bonus. You've got the flick bayonet on the underside. Yeah. I think yeah, over time it might lose yeah, any the, spring it, with Yeah, it. the spring. You should never really. Is he going to flick the bayonet? Watch. Yeah, that's it. No, it the business has been fueled by this passion for the past seven years, and they regularly travel the country hunting out new finds to fire the imagination of their customers. We're going to a fair at Brecon, and it's kind of down and dirty. It's, it's real. We kind of know what to expect because it's a lot of the dealers that we used to do business with. We're already prepping them and saying, look, bring out, bring out your dead, <laughs> in a way. You know, bring your stuff out, get, uh, you know, get the best out there, and we'll, we'll have a go at it. Come on, Trippy, up you get. Oh, well good done, boy. Andy. Good boy. They set off on the 40-mile journey to Wales, hoping their dealer contacts will have brought out their best items. What do we ex actually expect to find there? I mean, we've been there before and been almost unable to spend a penny. We've been there other times and we spent hundreds and hundreds of pounds. You, you honestly don't know. At Brecon, four times a year, the town hosts a specialist military antique market, drawing dealers and collectors from all over the country. You know, Brecon is like anywhere else now. It's the kind of, you know, replicas, reproductions. They're creeping into antiques, the word vintage. But I think we know well enough what to stay clear of. We've got to negotiate hard. That's the one yeah, key yeah. Really, that really drive people yeah. because there isn't much cash out there. They'll there isn't start, much money. They always do. They'll be starting real high. Yeah. We start real low and we meet in the middle if we want it. Yeah. Uh, 
Oh, there's Pete there, over there, look. Trophy! Employee and World War I specialist Pete Weston joins the team to add his expertise. Good to see you, good to see you. ready for action this morning. Always ready for action. Should we get cracking? Hit the road. Let's do it. Let's rock and roll. This way. Be careful today. There's going to be a lot of iffy stuff around, and that's just the people. <laughs> <laughs> The crew divide to conquer, each scouting out treasures for the shop. Got anything super duper, Andy? And rare pieces for special customers before they're snapped up. That's the National Fire Service helmet over there. The nice thing is, it's got a badge on it. Let's go and have a look at it. Oh, yeah, that is nice. I like that. So, so you've got the guy's name, got the number. guy's name, his number. A personalised original fireman's helmet from West London during the Blitz. It's just the sort of home guard memorabilia their customers love. It's on sale here for £80. Yeah. So you've got National Fire Service. Fair yeah. bit of wear on it, though. It's tidy, though, but yeah. we've got to get that down to 50, 55. Yeah. I don't think he's going to go that low. He might, he might. He might. If... OK, um, what's the very best on that? Best on that. Yeah, OK, that's fair. We'll take that. Eden, yep. Eden London, Eden Broadway. Thank you. Dave has been in the business long enough to know he'll make a profit and doesn't waste time haggling over the price. Next up, the search for a rare type of bayonet, a specific request from one of their regular customers. It's called a sawback, and their contact has requested one in its original scabbard or sheath. Dave spotted just the ticket. And usually there's no maker's mark on it. What's the best on the uh, right side? There isn't. It's a code which says cheap. Uh, <laughs> 220. No, no, you've got to. No, come on. Yeah, I mean, it's straight away, as soon as Dad's called the scabbard there, you know, we've seen that serrated edge. So that's the one we've been asked by the client to source. So. The sawback bayonet was standard issue for the engineer regiments in many European armies during the 19th century. It has a serrated edge designed as a tool to cut wood or clear tracks before battle. But in hand-to-hand -hand combat, it became a lethal weapon that ripped and tore flesh and bone. It inflicted such gruesome injuries that it became known as the butcher's blade. In 1907, 44 countries signed the Hague Convention prohibiting arms that caused unnecessary suffering. And by 1917, the sawback was no longer being issued. So today, they're rare finds. Dave hopes to seal the deal by offering to also take a second sword. Now, is ask about other stuff, see if we can bundle it in with the deal. Don't show too much uh, excitement around that. Don't let him know that that's the thing we want. 550 on the two. Uh, uh, no, it's a nice one. It's a nice, good, he, clean he one. He just said to me, he said to me, honestly, he said, we've already got one on the sword wheel. Nobody's even looked at them. They haven't. <laughs> if you come into the shop, you'll find lots of things that we haven't managed to see. Yeah, I know the feeling. This will just join the others. Yeah. So, is there nothing else? 550 um, on the two. Well, uh, that's a good offer. Go on then, we'll do that then. Okay, shake my hand. Yeah, okay. Then. <laughs> right, that's a good start to the day. The team has already bagged two items they know will appeal to their regular contacts. Cheers, I'll leave them there. I'll see you later. Yeah, thanks. Cheers. Medals are particularly sought after, and the fairs are wash with them today. But Dave's been collecting medals for 40 years. Not much gets past his expert eye. Top bar's Easy loose on there, but then you'd expect to see that, so... What's the price of that, Taff? 150. 125 and we'll shake on it. Taff, come on, look. God, it's, it's 180. We got out of bed very early this morning, it's, aren't we? It's, it's 180, you say, Lily, so... No, 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 130, 130. 140, and it's yours. 135. Oh, oh they have some teeth! This is bizarre. <laughs> Around the bazaar. <laughs> 
Their budget for the day has reached its limit, but one of Dave's contacts has sent up a special package. Charles, have you got something for me there? I have, yes. OK. Yeah, can I have a look? A friend of ours in Cardiff sent this up. I don't know what he said. He wouldn't say. He just said... He just said it's a special thing. You, do you know what is in there, do you? I don't I don't Oh, my God. There's tidy, isn't it? Oh, look at that. <laughs> wow. All right. D. Christensen. Christensen. I wonder who that is. Wow. Wow. And inside, a beautifully made and extremely valuable Victorian pistol. It's unusual to find all the original cleaning and loading tools intact. Is it an Adams or a Dean Adams or a I Tranter? Think it's, or I think it's Adams, isn't it? Dean Adams and Dean London. Wow. I'm looking for a name on there other than the gun maker's name. I think it's just on the box. The quality and personalised detail suggest it would have been made for a gentleman. The engraving on the box gives a tantalising clue to the story behind the gun. If you date that and date him, bingo. Yeah, but I'd say it dates to about the 18, 1850 to 1870, something like that. Something. Would have been used possibly in the Crimea. The trouble. This is the, the stuff of dreams. Stuff of dreams. You're not going to pick, pick something like that here today. You don't want to put it down, do you? You don't want to let it go. It's so beautiful. The price is frightening, mind yeah, you, but... I know. 2750. So we can't haggle him too well, yeah. a, a boat, that's what he said. <laughs> it's a stunning piece, rare and dripping in history. Dave negotiates to take it back to base to give them a bit of time to research its history before committing to the hefty price tag. But he, did he say to you, Charles, if you come back without it and without any money, oh, you're yes, dead? Yes, give us a David. <laughs> OK, yeah. great, all right. Charles will be in trouble. So that way we <laughs> might... Yeah, thanks a lot. See you. Thanks, bye-bye. Thank the team head home. OK, bags of swag, you've got everything. Got everything. Laden with potential profit. It's a new day at the shop in Lemster, and head of bookkeeping, Marie Westcott, is taking stock of business. My involvement is organisation, cleaning, keeping all the books in order. It's just little things that they won't think about. Nobody thinks about putting fresh water down for Troopy, and yet he's a very important member of the team. Expect the unexpected. That's the, that's the routine. Anyone could walk in with anything at any time and we cannot wait, really, for the first thing today. You know, Marie wants something that's to do with war horse. <laughs> As if on cue, the first visitor of the day, with a pair of Worcestershire Regiment horse brasses that he wants to sell. Have you got the other one with you? There you go, Dad. Yeah. So, go on, t tell us a little bit about them. Your father brought these back from the song. Yeah. yeah. He wasn't in the Worcester Regiment. He was an engineer, but uh, he took him off a dead horse. Of course, there was no one in the oh, horse. Re yeah. Really told you that, yeah, did he? Yeah. A million horses transported soldiers, artillery and medical supplies to the Western Front during the Great War. Some 400,000 perished, many overcome by the muddy terrain. One account from the time came from this man, Private Sidney Smith, he reported of the Somme. I had the terrible experience to witness three horses and six men disappear completely under the mud. The last horse went to a muddy grave, keeping his nostrils above the slush until the last second. A spurt of mud told me it was all over. Such tales of valor have instilled a love of the epic war horse to this day. I like them and I'd like to buy them. I had them valued so. Good, because then you can tell me what they're worth. Yes. 100 quid. <laughs> <laughs> You're throwing the horse in with that. <laughs> I don't know who valued them for you yeah. at that sort of price. He's... Auctioneer. You're buy... <laughs> You'd be buying the story yeah. more than the, yeah. the, the items, wouldn't you? Yeah. So it's kind of risky for us, but I like them. I mean, we were only saying this morning you wanted something related to a, a war horse. I'd be very generous, because you've been in before and you were kind enough to bring them back. 
I'll give it a 75. That's all right. Shake my hand. No problem. There you go. Yeah, yeah. thanks for bringing them in. My dad was in the engineers, and he took these brasses off a of dead horse. And they brought them back home, see, yeah. Uh, and uh, they're the Worcester Regiment. As a local regiment, Worcestershire regalia is extremely collectible. On the 31st of October 1914 in Ypres, the Worcestershire 2nd Battalion heroically held the line against German onslaught. During the action, protecting the Channel ports and Paris from invasion, the regiment lost half their troops. The Worcester Regiment is popular with local collectors, but Dave suspects the brasses may not have come from a war horse. I had doubts about them being yeah. horse brasses. Just, you know the why? weight's not the, there. They're too, they're too delicate, they're yeah. too small, they're too thin. Also, a little bit sharp, but if the, the horse has got that on the side, it'd have to, it would have to have sort of backing on yeah. both sides to stop the thing sticking into it. Now it's up to Steve and Pete to establish how these brasses were used. What well, we four and a half inches on those, so that it's about the same size as a helmet plate, but because of the the fitting fitting on the reverse, it's yeah. it's got a it, you know it's got to be something different. The use is different. From what I'm looking at now, it does kind of it's coming up with pouch badges and cross belt plates. A valley, valise badge, they call yeah. it, quite, yeah. quite. And that's just what these are, badges from a leather pouch or a valise designed to carry bullets. Yeah, I think that's definitely it. Yeah. These brasses are excellent examples of local regimental insignia, but the war horse story may be no more than family legend. Not always are those little stories factual or correct. And it's really devastating when you've got to say to somebody, actually, that's not what happened. Maybe sometimes you're better off just leaving it as it is and letting them carry on with, with what they think. I've always been a collector. It's in my blood guns and rifles and swords and daggers and everything else. And what better thing to do than to actually engage in something that you enjoy and at the same time you can treat as a business. And that's what we're doing here. To marry their passion for antiquity with the running of a successful business, Dave and Steve find extraordinary pieces of history and then match them up to just the right collector and the variety of objects they bought at the Brecon Fair have great potential. This is the one that excites me quite a bit. It's an absolute beauty. Was there anything comparable in the room yesterday? This was the quality that was there, it, and it it's was... It's an absolute beauty, it's a gem. I'd put it on 1855 to 1865, somewhere in that region. The Dean Adams revolver was deployed during the Crimean War between 1853 and 1856. Its prototype drew crowds at the Great Exhibition of 1851 as the first solid peace pistol in Britain. And the specific trigger design pinpoints the gun to a small window in the 1850s. The dealer wants a hefty price for the gun. Steve would like more time to do some research into D. Christison, but Dave has already moved the deal forward. Well, you haven't, we haven't bought this, have we? We haven't bought this yet, but... Yeah, I've done the deal. I've spoken to him this morning. Right. We've agreed it and everything. And so like, you've, agree, you've agreed at two and a half thousand pounds? Two and a half thousand. And he's going to try and get up next, next week sometime, so we'll sort him out when he comes up. Now Dave's promised to hand over the cash next week, the clock's ticking for Steve to establish who owned this gun. It's definitely a military issue as well. So how do you a civilian would have gone and bought that in 1860 or whatever? There's no time to lose. So Steve begins delving into regimental histories, hoping to connect this historic firearm to its original owner. Research always adds value. 
If you put an individual behind a piece of militaria, it's going to add value. It's more about the story than the item now. The owner's name engraved on the box is the first lead. I'm just going to put the surname in and see if there's only, like, one or two. And just as I do that, more Christmasons than you could shake a stick at. Checking them throws up just one potential record in the right period of military history. Donald Christensen. This has got to be him. He served in the New Zealand campaign in the 1860s. I'll pull the record up. But it's bad news. There's an error in the records. It's not New Zealand at all. That's India General Service Medal. That's way later. This is 1908. We can rule him out. This is definitely earlier. Steve will need to continue his search through different avenues of military archives. You can look at enlistment records, you know, attestation documents. You can look at medal rolls, looking at the War Graves Commission. All these things are there. But this has stumped me. I'm hitting brick walls with it. Despite an extensive search through the military records of the campaigns and service personnel of that period, Steve has drawn a blank. Meaning, for now, this pistol remains a mystery. Dad's going to be disappointed in me if this doesn't, <laughs> doesn't come off. Military antiques experts Dave and Steve Neuer specialise in marrying up people and prized possessions. Collectors travel from across the country to check out their latest acquisitions. Today, Dave's invited in a regular to take a look at the boxed pistol, once owned by the mysterious D. Christensen. Yeah, the, the research on the, the case revolver was just an enormous frustration. I, at that point, I lose heart with it a little bit, but Dad said, look, have faith in the, in the object. He's hopefully going to get us out of jail a little bit, because it was a big commitment. Morning, Stephen. How are you doing? We just well, need 14. Yeah. Marie, I don't suppose there's a chance of a coffee for Stephen, is there? You know, when you've got a minute. Coffee, yeah. Marie. Good to see you. Uh, coffee, please. Coffee, and yes, the sole oh, reason for coming. Stephen John is an established military collector. Right now, Stephen, be prepared to be blown away. Now, what? Buy a box? Yeah, exactly. What's in there? And John, Bob's your uncle. There we go. Superb. Look at that. Does that blow you away? Well, it could do, yeah. No, not quite. You're on the wrong That's side perhaps of it. Perhaps you might want to rephrase that. It is an absolute beauty. It would date, my guess, to somewhere in the early 1850s to about the mid-1860s. So you're talking about New Zealand, possibly even Crimea. Cased for a start. All the equipment in there, everything you'd expect to find, all in there. Have a feel of that, as they say. Now, while you're doing that, let me just point out something that yeah, is also, it. it's named. Do we know anything about the name? Ah, oh, no. <laughs> I trust you to cut straight to that. No. <laughs> no. Stevie's done quite a bit of work on it. Mm -hmm. We cannot find this guy. Where do you see stuff like that anymore? You don't. Only in your shop, David. Exactly. Only Thank you. Shop. Well said, well said, Stephen. Right. Cut to the chase, dear boy. No, you'll be falling about, killing yourself, laughing. How the hell can it be so cheap? That's what you'll be saying. No, honestly. <laughs> I'm going to give you the bottom the bestest, price, bestest. the bestest of the bestest. No negotiation, no discussion or debate, because you're a friend. Three grand. It's a steal, honestly. Ooh. It is, Stephen, it's a steal. An ordinary one without the personalised bit, without a lot of the bits being there, would set you back that sort of money. You don't need to give that much thought. That speaks volumes, it, it ticks every box. It is absolutely superb. And three is your rest. Three is honestly. That, I didn't start, there was no negotiation or haggling. No, that's the, that's the price. You can torture me, <laughs> but it won't reduce the price. So. <laughs>
Come on, you won't see anything like that in your lifetime, so shake my hands, Tom. Sorted. Done. God bless you. And I have been, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it is an absolute quality piece. David knows I've been looking out for something a bit different. He does have an eye for the unusual and good quality stuff. And today, to my cost, he's found something rather delightful. I could tell from a minute he saw that, the way he was looking at it, that we were going to have a deal, you know. There was never any doubt in my mind. If we had a day like this every day, I'd be dead within about three months, but I'd die with a smile on my face. So, yeah, what, could, what more could you want? So I missed uh, most of that deal, or there seemed to be a lot of activity you going on. Cracking. I sold the revolver, <laughs> got the full asking price that yeah, we wanted. Well done. Well 3,000, so yeah. can't complain. That's a decent £500 profit, just four days after buying the pistol. We got it in Sunday, here we are today, it's gone. I'm impressed. Yeah. Um, and he's happy, that's the important thing. Researching the personal stories behind historical artefacts is at the heart of the business. Today, Pete and Steve are on a visit to London's Fire Brigade Museum to find out more about the fire service helmet bought at the Brecon Fair. They're hoping to match the item to its original owner. You've got a number here and then a surname, and I'm not sure if there would be any records that, that exist or yeah, that would be retained. That would, that, yeah. that, that would be a dream. The London Fire Brigade Museum collection holds 80,000 pieces of firefighting equipment and service records dating back to the Great Fire of London in 1666. If anyone can track down who owned the helmet, it will be their experts. Hello. Hello. Hi, you must be Eleanor. I am. I'm Peter. Nice to meet this you, This is Peter. Steve. Hi, Eleanor. Steve, lovely to lovely meet you. Lovely to meet you too. Thanks Welcome for having us. Welcome to the London Fire Brigade Museum. This is the iconic helmet that would have been worn by firefighters during the Second World War. And I have to say that some of them weren't that happy about it and they carried on wearing their cork helmets until they realised that the debris and the shrapnel was probably going to end their lives prematurely yeah. and they decided they had to go for this. So this is made out of steel. If you're out in the open, you need this helmet. So this is the real deal. In the spring of 1939, Neville Chamberlain's government brought in conscription for single 20 to 22-year-old men. They signed up for active service as tensions grew in Europe, and a recruitment drive was launched for those remaining to volunteer for the fire service in preparation for war. Tens of thousands joined, and then war was declared in 1939. Fast forward a few months, and they're being referred to as the Darts and Snooker Brigade the army dodgers, <laughs> um, it's true. Yeah, it's and great. actually they were really lampooned in the press, quite unfairly, for being seen to not be fighting. But that all changed dramatically on the 7th September 1940, which was the first night of the yeah. Blitz. By 6 p.m. that fateful night, over 300 German bombers had pounded London. The fires that broke out all over the city guided a second raid in the blackout darkness. And the vast majority of the firefighters were new recruits, face to face with a real fire for the first time. One account was told by 24-year-old Frank Hurd. Fires everywhere. The sky was a vivid orange glow, and all the time the whole area was being mercilessly bombed. The road shuddered with the explosions. 48 hours later, Exhausted firefighters were walking down the streets and people were coming out of their houses with a cup of tea and a jam sandwich saying thank you so much. And they went from being zeros to heroes. Yeah. And by the end of the war, Churchill's calling them heroes with grimy faces. Yeah. And it's, it's an often forgotten part of history. When we think about the Blitz, people think about blackout and they think about air raid sirens and people rushing to shelters in their garden or the underground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What they don't think about are thousands of regular people running out into the streets into the thick of it, into bombs falling around their heads. And that's what the fire service did in London during the Second World War. It was ordinary people with ordinary jobs doing extraordinary things.
In terms of the helmet you've got here, so we've got a name and a number. The National Fire Service was essentially controlled by the Home Office, and it was an enormous beast, an administrative nightmare. But uh, unfortunately, all of those records, yeah. they, they don't exist, I'm afraid. The hope of finding out more about who wore the helmet seems to have come to an end. We, we encounter this all the time, don't we? So. I know. I'll hand this back to you. Right, OK. It's a, it's a lovely specimen, so congratulations. Thank you ever so much. It's been absolutely brilliant. And are we OK to have a good look around? Thank you. Among the exhibition photographs, an evocative image of firefighters clearing debris after the blitz. I do believe that I can see a 34 on there. Never, have never, a look, have a look. No, that is never. definitely a 34. Yeah. The brave volunteers appear to be from the 34 division. Madness. Perhaps one of these was Clark, who wore this very helmet. This was there. The fires were raging yeah. all around it. Yeah. The person was underneath trying to do everything they could. To be thrown in to such a major catastrophic environment as that and to have to deal with it, you know, unbelievable. Well, it sums up the British kind of spirit in the face of what looked like impending invasion and disaster and taking enormous risk and, and making enormous sacrifice. Collecting military antiques is more popular than ever. Oh, that's a steal. Honestly, that price, it's a steal for what it is. Trust me. As well as the shop, War and Son trade online, selling to enthusiasts as far afield as the United States and New Zealand. Many are returning customers who enlist Dave and Steve to find them specific items to add to their bespoke collections, like the 19th century sawback. Dad bought this and uh, one of these swords, actually, which should, should have a value of more than 500, and he paid 550. So, Dad was happy to sell this for 225. Sawbacks are becoming increasingly hard to find. This one is going to a regular visitor to the shop, who tasked Dave with tracking one down for him to buy. He's already paid, and we're just holding for him when he next comes to us. <laughs> There's always a brisk trade in the more quirky and unusual items, like this highly sought-after piece of trench art. I should be sorry to see this thing, though. It's a beauty. Well, you got 250 quid for it. Did we? Well, that's, yeah, that's good. Yeah, I'll pack them both. That is an absolute beauty. It's the best piece of trench art I've ever seen. Towards the end of World War I, soldiers of all sides began returning home, and troops with workshops and time on their hands took to repurposing spent bullets into decorative objects. Soon, a whole industry grew up and ran well beyond the end of the war. I mean, this is referred to as trench art, but it isn't necessarily made out of, you know, old shells, but it, it's, it's of that ilk and it's, it's superb. Believe it or not, it's a lighter. A cigarette lighter. Cigarette lighter, and it actually works. There's it's obviously probably, no, no fuel in there's it. There's no fuel in it, yeah. The spark's still there. The workmanship and the time that's gone, love that's gone into that, it's unbelievable. Sale complete. The lighter is on its way to a brand new customer who spotted the trend chart on the shop's website. So that's that. Get the label on and then let's get them away. In town today is collector Stephen John, who bought the Victorian boxed revolver for £3,000. He's discovered some fascinating information about the original owner, Dee Christensen. David, he had said, you know, if you can find anything out, let us know, because he, as an individual, he's genuinely interested in the story of stuff, even though he sold it. It was their gun for a while, and they like to know um, the history about who owned it, where it went. 
I've dug in and I think we've got the man. Morning, everybody. Morning. Morning. Yeah, right. Good to see you. Good to see you. David, how are you? Oh, you're good to see you. Right. Good to see you. <laughs> Steve. Thanks for those of you. Stephen has spent time scouring military records, libraries and newspaper archives, researching who may have owned the top-of-the-range pistol 170 years ago. I know. All right, now here we go. Right, two, two clues. One was the name and two was the gun itself. The gun is actually cutting edge. That gives us two clues. Um, one, it was the first of its kind built in a frame and was hammerless, so it had a rapid rate of fire, which was much appreciated by infantry officers off to the Crimea. When war broke out on the Russian and Turkish border in 1853, it launched a bloody three-year battle, causing over 500,000 casualties. Pioneering nurse Florence Nightingale was one of the many working in field hospitals. In the military records of the Crimean War, there's no evidence of an officer called D. Christensen. But the gun could have been carried by one of the many non-military personnel deployed to support the terrible conflict. So I thought, doctors. There were Brits who went out there to fight with the Turks who were doctors. And we go then for D. Christison, Christison, yep. and then, ta-da! He's only gone and done it. Stephen found an obituary for a David Christison, a medical doctor working at Renkioi Hospital in Turkey in 1855. It was a state-of-the-art hospital, established after Florence Nightingale's reports of patients grimed with mud, dirt, and swarming with vermin and huge lice. 22 prefabricated wooden huts designed by Isambard Brunel formed this temporary hospital at Renkioi to treat a thousand patients in modern, clean conditions. So the war office commissioned this particular hospital, of which there's a report. And buried in it is the list of staff of Renkioi Hospital, and there's your man, David Christensen. So we know he was there, not just because of his obituary, but he's listed by the report afterwards. And as you look around for David Christensen, I came across Ta-da! and a photograph. Oh, of there's him. a picture of him there. There he is. Superb. Yeah, here's, yeah. here's, here's our man. <laughs> That's magic. There magic we go. Yeah, That's that magic. is remarkable. David Christensen was born in 1828 in Edinburgh. Four years after qualifying as a doctor, he served in Crimea until an illness caused him to return to Scotland. He became a pioneering scientist in the field of archaeology until his death at the age of 82. As far as I'm concerned, he's your man. Definitely. Yeah. His gun is a lasting memento of one of the most important wars of the Victorian era. What a special thing that becomes now. I mean, it was great before. It's now even better. As a collector, you want to tell your story. I mean, I've got an image of the guy who we think once owned that pistol. That's really good stuff, and you want to share it with people because you get excited and you like to share excitement. You don't have a pistol like that that is state-of-the-art, that is the latest thing on the market to shoot bottles in your backyard. You know, he was obviously going either to the Crimea or to the mutiny because it was that sort of period. The man has proved it, so there we go. Good result for everybody. <laughs> It's been a busy time for the shop, with the new stock bought at Brecon attracting plenty of attention. But the team is yet to trace the original owner of this Home Guard firefighter's helmet. So what are you... You've had a look into this, Pete? Yeah, this yeah. This is the, the Ealing the, the, Fire the Service. The thing that, uh, that, that really resonates for me with this is this helmet is made in Sheffield by a company called Harrison Brothers. The thing that really touches me is that my father told me that in World War II, when he left school, 
this was his first job making these helmets. Get out of town. No, 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 honestly, make honest, stuff honestly. You're not allowed to make no, stuff no, up on, here. Honest, honestly, honestly. And then he goes on to join the army and he goes to, to Italy and fights in Italy. But Seriously, this, that's yeah, absolutely Honest mental. to God, truth, yeah. Pete's father, Frank, served as a corporal in the Royal Army Service Corps in the Second World War. In 1945, he returned to Sheffield and to his job in the steelworks, staying there until he retired. I've got this emotional attachment to this already. Being that it was produced in Sheffield, <laughs> it's, being it's that my all over father this, yeah. did these sort of things, yeah. you know, I feel I've got to have it. That's amazing, though, yeah. yeah. It is a beautiful, yeah. beautiful thing, isn't it? Yeah. I feel almost transported to that time. Yeah. I'm really happy with that. What a find. It's got a sold ticket on it already, <laughs> if the price is right. <laughs>